So nice to meet you, Matt. Nice to meet you. The big news this past week has been the unverified report about mm -hmm. alleging that he was blackmailed, that he was compromised, that he was spied on by the Russians. You lived and worked in Russia for a long time. What, what's your take on all of that? Is he a, a puppet of Putin? Well, it's, it's very hard to say. You know, I lived in Russia for a long time. I personally remember uh, Putin destroying uh, government officials with sex tapes. Uh, I was there. I remember watching him uh, when he was the FSB chief uh, give an analysis of a sex tape involving uh, a character named Yuri Skaratov. Um, they've done this over and over again in their past. Uh, there was a justice minister. There was the former prime minister, Mikhail Kasayanov. Um, so this is something they do. It but the Russians were saying yesterday they would never do anything like that. They would never. Well, no, that's ridiculous. They've done it demonstrably in, in their past. Uh, and it doesn't defy belief at all that they would do it with, with foreign businessmen. In fact, I, I would think that they would do that more with foreign businessmen than they would with their own. Um, however, there's really no concrete evidence still that Trump uh, is involved in any of the shenanigans that have been alleged. Um, you know, there's some evidence for one side of this equation, which is about uh, Putin's meddling in the electoral process and hacking the Democratic National Committee, and there are, there are experts who have um, reasons for believing that, that he, he did that, that are, that are good reasons. Uh, but there's really no concrete evidence that Trump is in on it in any way, or that he was anything other than an, uh, a moronic beneficiary of Putin's geopolitical whimsy. So what did you think of the decision by BuzzFeed to publish the whole document full of unverified information and even um, acknowledging there were errors in it? It's, it's crazy. I mean, the, you know, in America we have this standard in journalism we call the malice standard, which is we're not supposed to publish anything if we have um, any kind of doubts about the veracity of the material that we publish. And here we have a news organization that's openly telling you, we have doubts about the veracity of this material, but decide for yourself. What do you think of that argument? I don't think it's a good argument. I think, the, look, we, we've had this problem now for over a decade in America, which is that we have two tiers of the media. We have this sort of clickbait uh, internet tier where anything goes and all kinds of material circulates and it's been accelerated by the social media. And then we have this upper tier of what we call the legacy media where theoretically we don't do things like that. We check, we verify, we don't put things that are, that are uh, you know, dubious or knowingly untrue. But what we're allowing them to do now is, is ping pong back and forth. Uh, you know, the, the legacy media reports on, the, on the, um, the less legitimate media all the time. So it's an end run around the old protections. And uh, we've had a breakdown because of that. Well, and there's this phenomena of fake news. Right. Uh, where's the line between the fake news, propaganda, the real news? I mean, how on earth? The world is changing. It's extremely difficult because it's very hard for journalists to pretend that there are, that, for instance, there's a news story that everybody's talking about that you can't confirm. How do you report on that? If you can't confirm the, for, the core allegation that's in the story, but it's news everywhere and everyone's talking about it, you can't not cover it. On the other hand, you can't really cover it either. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. In the old days, a story like this probably would never have appeared in the networks. It wouldn't have been in the New York Times. It wouldn't have been on CNN. There's a huge focus on the Hillary Clinton emails during the campaign. Now there's this focus on the Putin-Trump right. links. I mean, there, he has said a number of surprising things about Putin, uh, stances. He's had people close to Putin that are close to him. Right. You don't think there's something going on that should be talked about there? What I think and what I can report are two completely different things, which is the problem with all of this. I mean, yeah, there's circumstantial evidence. The difference between what's going on with the, the, the Trump-Putin alleged links and the Clinton email story is that we in the press could pretty easily confirm that those emails were genuine. Uh, there were people referred to in those emails whom we could contact. We could ask about the specifics of some of these dialogues that were going on. Um, I talked to people who, who wrote some of those, those uh, emails, so I know that they were true. Uh, and th in this case, we don't have anything like that. We can't confirm any of these sources. We can't, we can't talk to the people who are spreading any of these rumors, and we, ha we haven't seen this tape that allegedly is out there, for instance. Um, so it's very, very difficult. I don't know how people, it, it's a thorny issue for journalists. 
these allegations are just the latest in this crazy race. This, um, he mocked women, he mocked Latinos, he mocked disabled people. Yeah. Is there anything that can hurt, that can stop this guy? It was amazing uh, watching this uh, throughout the course of the campaign. There was really nobody that was left in the list who, who he didn't mock at some point uh, during the campaign. The only people, the only group that I think he didn't make fun of during the campaign was like kids with cancer. Uh, everybody else, veterans, uh, you know, pe the people from China, uh, the disabled, women, you know, minorities, uh, everybody does, was thrown in. So does no one care? Like why, why does no one care? Some of it is a backlash against the perception in America that we're too careful about what we say. We've had this, this tradition in our campaign journalism going back for quite a while now where when a candidate slips up, does something dumb, we immediately sort of swirl ar around the candidate and uh, announce that, that that person is no longer a legitimate a viable politician. The we media. Did it. Yeah, the media. Yes, we yeah. in the media, we do that. We did that to people like Howard Dean. Yeah! Gary Hart was another senator who, you know, had an affair. Um, and the public doesn't like the idea that we're deciding for them who gets to be a candidate and who doesn't. And I think Trump was a little bit of a backlash against that instinct that we have to sort of say this person can't be president anymore. You compare the media to the, the mean girls, the Heathers. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've been on the campaign plane and uh, I've been one of the unpopular kids who's been banished to the back of the plane to sit with the techies. Um, you know, there are, there are documentarians I know who, who were filming the other reporters in the plane who became uh, unpopular with the other reporters because that was theoretically uh, um, off limits. You weren't supposed to write about what went on inside the bubble. And so they got to, be, got to sit in, uh, in the back with me as well. Because um, you have been very critical. I have, yeah. yeah. I've written about the media, I've written about how we cover stories, about, I've written you about... You say they're, they're in bed, basically, with corrupt politicians. Yeah, and then also that there's this, uh, there's this corrupting relationship that happens. It's almost like a kind of Stockholm Syndrome on the campaign trail where you're with the same people over and over again, week after week, month after month, and you start to sympathize with the people uh, on the campaign. And uh, I think that's what's happened over the years is that reporters and politicians have adopted each other's point of view and they've lost touch with how ordinary people think and they don't talk to people out there as much. Trump capitalized on that. He sensed that he made us in the media villains, uh, uh, representatives of this out of touch um, ivory tower political culture. The election is being rigged by corrupt media. So is it fair? I mean, I think there's some fairness to it. And as much as I dislike Donald Trump, I think he, he, he hit a note that there hit several notes that were true during this campaign, and that was one of them. It wasn't just the media f fighting back against Trump at, at some point or exploiting him. Um, the left in general has been called extremely smug, whether it's the, the yeah. satire, the comedians mocking his supporters all the time. What makes you think she has AIDS? The uh, way her uh, husband used to be. So you think Bill had AIDS? Yes. So how did Bill Clinton get AIDS? Probably messing around with uh, Magic Johnson. That's the natural conclusion? Yes. You mock his supporters, or have, um, sure. so it's all your fault. It is. I mean, there's certainly there's, there's a lot of resentment out there toward these sort of snide urban, uh, especially East and West Coast liberal types who uh, people in what we call flyover America, uh, they view us as snobs who are looking down on regular people and we're always trying to tell them how to run their lives even though we can't change an oil filter by ourselves. And um, there's a lot of resentment towards, towards that kind of person. And, and this is a, it's a class division that we, we've always had a difficult time uh, talking about in this country. Uh, we just don't do class very well. And so that's one of the reasons why this uh, Trump phenomenon kind of crept up on everybody. It's because this, these divisions are things that we don't normally pay a lot of attention to. He's about to become president. Do you think he really, really wanted to? No, I don't. Really? I, and most reporters I know who, who covered him early in the campaign also believe that he never really thought that this was going to work out. He, he acted like a guy who was kind of doing this as, uh, on a dare, like somebody who had just joined a fraternity. Um, he was clearly having a lot of fun at the beginning. Uh, he was loose and unscripted, and he 
he would go into events and just kind of do everything off the cuff. He had no strategy whatsoever. And um, so it, now what? <laughs> well, now he's, he's said president. a lot of things. Yeah. Does he believe those things? And the, uh, the problem is, it's impossible to know what Donald Trump believes because he's all over the map. Every, his his statements are completely contradictory. Just to take an example, he's taken basically every position on the abortion issue. So we don't know what he really believes there. I mean, his early statements where he said he was pro-choice, his later statements where he said women should be punished for having abortions. What do we we don't we don't know? Is he beholden to the people that got him there, or is he his own man? Well, he, he didn't take donations from the usual suspects on the amounts that previous presidents have, but at, at the same time, he has already five people from Goldman Sachs in his White House. So even though uh, Barack Obama, you know, his number one campaign contributor, private campaign contributor, was Goldman Sachs, um, is Trump any less beholden to them, you know, now that he's, he's in office? At the end of the book, you say, welcome to the end of the dream. What do you mean? Well, I was talking in that particular instance about um, how we've had a kind of a template for race relations in this country dating back to the early 60s. One of the things that happened after this election ended is some people on the Democratic side said, well, it's all about race. There's nothing we could have we done. Um, this is just the, you know, the, uh, the apotheosis of you know, a racist movement in this country. But I think it's a mixture of a lot of things. I think it's, it's uh, economic discontent that's fueling some of these racist attitudes. If you go to a lot of places in this country um, that used to be kind of thriving industrial towns, there are, these, there are these dead, hollowed out wastelands where people are in this rampant opiate addiction, alcoholism, suicide. This is like formerly middle class white America is like a, a disaster area now. And people who live in those places are incredibly angry and they're looking for somebody to blame. And Trump kind of gave them somebody to blame. And this is kind of the classic formula for racial discontent. You know, your, your people are not doing well and you have a politician who tells them, well, this, this is who's to blame. And that's where all the anger comes from. So four years from now, will he still be here? Will, uh, where will America be? Well, I mean, I think the, the history of what's happened recently suggests that this was an, an extreme aberration. You know, Barack Obama's two victories demonstrated that there's this expanding coalition of you know sort of uh, liberal whites and minorities um, that should, in the future, uh, win all these elections. Uh, but this was this was an extreme situation where. Um, we had a, a Democratic campaign that was kind of flawed from the start, and Trump was an extraordinary figure that we just didn't know how to, how to prepare for. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen again. I hope not, but it could, I guess. Hmm. It's been great to talk thank, to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Yeah.